This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 99. Coming up on Space Time... Osiris Rex arrives at the potential Earth-impacting asteroid Bennu. Another door closes on trying to solve the dark matter mystery. And the White Dwarf heading to go supernova. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has arrived at its target, the potential Earth-impacting asteroid Bennu. The probe completed its 2 billion kilometer journey, transitioning to a position about 20 kilometers above the asteroid's sun-facing surface. The spacecraft will now begin a preliminary survey of the NEO, or near-Earth object, with flyovers over Bennu's North Pole, Equatorial Region and South Pole, getting as close as 7 kilometers during each flyover. These manoeuvres will allow the first direct measurements of the half-kilometre wide asteroid's mass. Eventually, OSIRIS-REx will swoop down to altitudes just one and a quarter kilometres above the grey, boulder-strewn surface for close-up observations. The primary science goals of this survey are to refine estimates of Bennu's mass and spin rate and to generate a more precise model of its diamond-like shape. The OSIRIS-REx mission will help investigate how planets form and how life began in our solar system, as well as improve science's understanding of asteroids which have the potential to hit the Earth. Asteroids are the remnants of building blocks that helped form the planets and enabled life. Those like Bennu contain natural resources such as water, organics and metals. In fact, future exploration and economic development of planet Earth may well rely on asteroids for these materials. To get where it is now, the probe began to execute a series of four asteroid approach and braking manoeuvres back in October, slowing the spacecraft down to match Bennu's speed and trajectory. The spacecraft will enter orbit around Bennu on the last day of the year, December 31st. In the process, making the monolith the smallest celestial body ever orbited by a spacecraft. It's a crucial step in OSIRIS-REx's multi-year mission, and it's a mission marking many firsts for space exploration. It'll be the first US mission to carry samples from an asteroid back to Earth, and the largest samples to be returned from space since the days of the Apollo moon mission era. It'll also be the first spacecraft to study a primitive B-type asteroid, that is an asteroid rich in carbon and organic molecules which make up life here on Earth. And it's also the first mission to study a potentially hazardous asteroid in order to try and determine the factors that alter their courses, bringing them closer to Earth. In February next year, the spacecraft will begin efforts to globally map and survey Bennu to identify at least two possible sample collection sites. After collection sites are selected, sample collection is slated for early July 2020, when the spacecraft will briefly touch down on the asteroid surface to retrieve at least 60 kilograms of regular, that is, dirt and rocks, from Bennu for return to Earth. OSIRIS-REx will then head back towards the Earth, ejecting the sample return capsule as it passes. That capsule will hopefully parachute down into the Utah desert in September 2023. The 2,110-kilogram Origins Spectral Interpretation Resources Identification Security Regolith Explorer, or OSIRIS-REx for short, was launched aboard an Atlas V rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida on September 8, 2016, on a 2 billion kilometer seven-year sample return mission. The spacecraft's science payload includes a thermal spectrometer, a visible and infrared spectrometer, a laser altimeter, an X-ray spectrometer, and a suite of cameras. Bennu is the name of a mythological Egyptian bird. Importantly, the asteroid is listed as a potentially hazardous object, with a 1 in 2700 chance of impacting the Earth between 2175 and 2199. But a more accurate assessment of Bennu's probability for Earth impact will require a very detailed understanding of the asteroid's shape and its composition in order to determine the magnitude and direction of the Yakovsky effect. The Yakovsky effect is caused by sunlight warming the dayside surface of a rotating body such as an asteroid. As the asteroid turns, the night side cools and releases this heat, which acts as a tiny amount of thrust, exerting a force which can change an asteroid's direction over time. If Bennu were to impact the Earth, the expected kinetic energy associated with the collision would be equivalent to 1,200 megatons of TNT, more than all the nuclear weapons ever exploded. 
Bennu will pass some 750,000 kilometres above the Earth's surface on September the 23rd, 2060. Now, this close approach will affect the next close approach, which will be on September the 25th, 2135. That approach will be much closer, somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 kilometres. Now, there's no chance of an Earth impact in 2135, but it will be close. The thing is, and this is where it gets interesting, that 2135 approach could position Bennu to pass through a gravitational keyhole, and that could create an impact scenario in a future encounter. In fact, there are several potential impact windows for Bennu, the most threatening on September the 24th, 2196, when there's a 1 in 11,000 chance of a direct Earth impact. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. We're talking about the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, which I think is just the most awesome name. This is really, uh, once again, the kind of thing that we're seeing more of in our present regime of robotic exploration of the solar system. The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, a NASA spacecraft which has been travelling since 2016, has just arrived in orbit around its target, which is an asteroid called Bennu. It's an important mission because not only will this allow up close and personal study of an asteroid, which is particularly interesting for a number of reasons, I'll get to them in a minute, but also the plan is that the spacecraft will actually return a sample of the dust of this asteroid back to Earth. So it's going to be another couple of years, uh, maybe not quite a couple of years, something like 18 months, when the sample collection will take place. So uh, the, the idea is to study the asteroid from orbiting around it. And at the moment, it's only seven kilome- the spacecraft is only seven ki- kilometres above the surface of Bennu. So we're already seeing some great images. The asteroid will be photographed, will be imaged, will be analysed to death by remote sensing. But then mid-2020, we'll see this sample being collected to, from the surface. With a return, actually, about three years later, a return to Earth, because it's quite a long trip, just turning to the asteroid itself, it's a potentially hazardous asteroid. It's one that could collide with the Earth. So its orbit intersects uh, the Earth's orbit. Uh, and in fact, there is um, the statistics are that in uh, something like... 150 to 170 years down the track, late 22nd century, Mm. there is a non-zero chance of a collision between Bennu and the Earth. Oh, you've got to love that terminology, a non-zero chance. It's one in 2,700. Mm. So, you know, that's pretty, it's pretty small, but it's not zero. Um, And the, the thing about these collision statistics is that they're always based on probabilities because you never quite know what an asteroid is going to do. It could pass close to the Earth and in the meantime one of its passes reasonably close to the Earth might well give it a little bit of a gravitational nudge that could change its trajectory enough that in a hundred years or so that would bring about a collision. That's why it's all based on probabilities because you can't be certain exactly where it's going to go. One of the other things that's of interest in this is the Yarkovsky effect. Um, This effect of the uneven heating of the surface of an asteroid producing a thrust that actually accelerates the asteroid. So a series Rex, one of its tasks is going to be to measure that effect and to give us an idea of how big it is. It's not really been properly quantified. There was an experiment done some time ago that gave us some indication that the the Yarkovsky effect is real and actually does change the orbit of asteroids. But this is um, a much more measured approach with a lot more detail being taken. And finally, the other thing that's really interesting about this asteroid is it's it's a particularly dark in color. It's got what's called a low albedo. It doesn't reflect that much of the sun's light. I can't remember what its albedo is, but it's quite low. And it looks as though... Sounds like a few people I know. But anyway, go on. This is... uh, I'm not going (laughs) to... This is indicative that it's probably a rather primitive asteroid, but has a lot of organic compounds on its surface. You know, the the, the materials that make up life, the c- carbon-containing chemicals that are of great interest to astrobiologists. And so the, the theory is that this asteroid represents a sample of the early material of the of the solar system, stuff that the solar system basically w- was formed from. And that's one reason why this asteroid has been chosen, to bring back a sample of this stuff and find out what's there. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts.
and this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new dark matter observatory in South Korea has failed to find any supporting evidence backing a 20-year-old controversial claim identifying dark matter. Dark matter is an invisible, mysterious substance, which is concerning because it comprises some 80% of all the matter in the universe. Only 20% of the universe's matter is made up of the stuff we know about. Stars, planets, people, dogs, cats and radio stations. Scientists know dark matter is real because they can measure its effect on normal matter. But they've never been able to identify exactly what it is. That's because it doesn't interact with normal matter in any other way other than gravitationally. The one exception to all this has been this long-debated claim by Dharma, the Dark Matter Collaboration, which reported what it said were positive observations of dark matter using a sodium iodide detector array. And so the claim has rested for the past 20 years. Then in 2016, scientists with the COSINE 100 experiment, based at the Yangyang Underground Laboratory in South Korea, began to explore Dharma's claim. It's taken until now because this is the first experiment to be sensitive enough to test Dharma's research using the same sodium iodide target material. The COSINE 100 collaboration have now published their initial findings in the journal Nature, and those findings challenge Dharma's claim. The first phase of COSINE 100's work searches for dark matter by looking for an expected excess of signal over the expected background in the detector. The thing is, the collaboration found no excess of signal in its data, and that puts Dharma's annual modulation signals at odds with results from other experiments. But the COSINE 100 scientists aren't dismissing everything yet. They say it'll still take several more years of data to fully confirm or refute Dharma's results. The COSINE 100 experiment uses eight thallium-doped sodium iodine crystals arranged in a 4x2 array, giving a total target mass of 106 kilograms. Each crystal is coupled to two photosensors to measure the amount of energy deposited in the crystal. The sodium iodide crystal assemblies are immersed in 2,200 litres of iodide-emitting liquid. This allows the identification and subsequent reduction of radioactive backgrounds observed by the crystals. The whole detector assembly is contained in a nested arrangement of copper, lead and plastic shielding to reduce the background contribution of external radiation and cosmic ray muons. Now, although the search will go on, the thing is these initial results already carve out a fair portion of the possible dark matter search region drawn by the Dharma signal. And there's now little room left for this claim to be from dark matter interaction, that is, unless the dark matter model is significantly modified. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Astronomers have detected a bright X-ray outburst from a white dwarf which could be counting down to go supernova. A report in the journal Nature suggests the combination of X-ray and optical emissions being detected by this white dwarf, catalogued as Assassin 16OH, means it could be the fastest growing white dwarf ever observed. The white dwarf was detected some 200,000 light years away in the nearby dwarf galaxy, the Small Magellanic Cloud. White dwarfs are the stellar corpses of dead sun-like stars. In somewhere around 7 billion years from now, our sun will run out of most of its core nuclear fuel. It will then expand into a red giant and puff off its outer gaseous envelope, exposing its white-hot stellar core, a white dwarf about the size of the Earth, which will then slowly cool over the eons of time. But unlike our solitary sun, most stars in the universe are in multiple star systems. And when one of the stars in such a system becomes a white dwarf, and it's close enough to a companion star in the system, it can start to gravitationally draw matter off that companion. And that's what astronomers think is happening with Assassin 16OH. They've detected distinctive soft X-ray emissions from Assassin 16OH, which is in a binary system. These soft X-rays are produced by gas, actually a plasma, at temperatures of several hundred thousand degrees. But the X-ray emissions from Assassin 16OH is much brighter than the soft X-rays being produced in the atmosphere of normal stars. And that places it in a special category of so-called super-soft X-ray sources. For years, astronomers have thought that super-soft X-ray emissions from white dwarf stars are produced by nuclear fusion in a hot, dense layer of hydrogen and helium nuclei on the surface of the white dwarf. This material accumulates from the infall of matter from a companion star onto the white dwarf surface. And when enough matter is accumulated, 
temperatures and pressures trigger a nuclear fusion explosion. However, Assassin 1608 shows there's much more to the story. The binary was first discovered by Assassin, the all-sky automated survey for supernovae, a collection of around 20 optical telescopes distributed around the globe to automatically survey the entire sky every night for supernovae and other transient events. Astronomers then used NASA's Chandra and Swift Space Telescopes to detect the super-soft X-ray emissions. The study's lead author Tom McCurran from Texas Tech says in the past, super-soft X-ray sources have all been associated with nuclear fusion on the surface of white dwarfs. However, the optical light being observed from Assassin 16OH isn't increasing quickly enough to be caused by an explosion, and the Chandra data shows the emissions coming from only a very small region on the white dwarf surface. Also, this source is hundreds of times fainter in optical light than white dwarfs known to be undergoing fusion on their surface. So these observations, plus the lack of evidence for gas flowing away from the white dwarf, all provide strong arguments against fusion having taken place on the white dwarf. Now, because none of the signs of nuclear fusion are present, the authors are presenting a new, different hypothesis. Now, as with the fusion explanation, the white dwarf would appear to be pulling in gas from a companion star, in this case a red giant. In a process called accretion, the gas is being pulled into a large disk surrounding the white dwarf and becomes hotter and hotter as it spirals down towards the white dwarf. The gas then falls onto the white dwarf, producing X-rays along a belt where the disk meets the star. The rate of inflow of matter through this disk varies significantly. But when the material is flowing more quickly, the X-ray brightness of the system becomes much higher. In fact, Makaron says the transfer of mass is happening at a higher rate than in any other system previously seen. He says if the white dwarf keeps gaining mass, it may reach the chandra sekar limit of 1.44 times the mass of the Sun. And if it does so, this white dwarf will go supernova. The chandra sekar limit is the maximum mass under which electron degeneracy prevents two identical fermion particles such as electrons from simultaneously occupying the same quantum state at the same time. The process prevents a dead stellar corpse like a white dwarf from gravitationally collapsing to anything denser, such as a neutron star or black hole. Put simply, you can only squeeze these things so far. However, once a stellar core grows beyond this chandra sekar limit of 1.44 times the mass of the Sun, it can break through the electron degeneracy barrier, triggering a thermonuclear or type 1a supernova, an explosion powerful enough to completely destroy the white dwarf and briefly outshine the entire galaxy. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Three new crew members have arrived safely aboard the International Space Station. The fast rendezvous flight path saw the Soyuz MS-11 capsule dock with the Russian Poisk module just six hours after launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. Vehicle to internal power. The first umbilical tower retracted. Auto sequence initiated. That second tower now retracting 10 seconds from launch. Second umbilical tower separated. Engines have started and are now at the preliminary thrust level, throttling up. And liftoff. Lift we have liftoff of Anne McLean to beat St. Jacques and Oleg Kononenko blasting through the Kazakh sky to the International Space Station. Everything looking good so far. Good first stage performance. Soyuz delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust. Everything is fine on board. Everything looking good. Vehicle is stable. Good first stage performance. Vehicle now traveling over 1,100 miles per hour. 80 seconds. All parameters are nominal. Escape tower has been um, jettisoned, and those four strap bomb boosters also jettisoned. They've completed their job and will drop away at an altitude of 28 miles. Uh, we're feeling fine, and everything is excellent. On board. Second stage, this core stage, still performing uh, well. The launch shroud has been jettisoned, revealing the Soyuz underneath. Launch shroud jettisoned confirmed. This second stage will continue to burn until 4 minutes 43 seconds into the flight. Uh, second stage providing somewhere between 178,000 and 222,000 pounds of thrust. Beach, your roll. 
parameters are all nominal. Copy. Second stage separation confirms. Copy. And we have confirmation of a good second stage separation. The third stage is lit. The hot staging technique start burning before the end of the uh, second stage and actually push that second stage away. We'll burn for about four minutes and two seconds, providing 67,000 pounds of thrust. Vehicle is steady. Third stage thrusters are operating nominally. The third stage will continue to burn until about uh, 8 minutes 45 seconds into the flight. Everything is excellent on board the Soyuz. The crew is doing well. The velocity now almost 13,500 miles per hour. Once the third stage delivers the Soyuz to orbit and the module is separated, a series of pre-programmed commands will be executed to prepare the Soyuz for orbital operations. These stored commands, called time-tagged commands, allow many of the Soyuz systems to be automatically activated by onboard computers at precise times stored in those computers. Third stage separation is confirmed. And we have confirmation of third stage separation. Single liquid-fueled engine has shut down and dropped away at an altitude of 126 statute miles. Congratulations with the... Uh, Everything's still looking good. The third stage is performing an avoidance maneuver by opening a valve in its liquid oxygen tank. Thank you very much for your support. This is Moscow. And so use capsule and crew safely in orbit. The spacecraft is automatically executing its pre-programmed commands to deploy the antennas and solar arrays. This successful flight follows October's dramatic Soyuz MS-10 ascent abort as the Expedition 57 crew was sent on an emergency high-G ballistic descent and landing shortly after launch. They escaped unharmed, but the failed launch raised fresh concerns about the state of the Russian space program. Russian investigators quickly traced the problem to a faulty sensor in the separation system on one of the Soyuz FG rocket's four strap-on liquid-fueled boosters. This prevented the booster from being jettisoned cleanly two minutes after launch, instead slamming into the core stage and triggering a catastrophic explosion. The new Expedition 58 crew, who are now on station, will eventually replace the Expedition 56 crew members who have been forced to extend their stay on station following the Soyuz MS-10 failure. The Expedition 56 crew are now slated to return to Earth aboard their Soyuz MS-09 capsule on December the 20th. By the way, that's the same Soyuz capsule which sprung an air leak a couple of months ago, venting atmosphere from the orbiting outpost into space. NASA and the Russian space agency Roscosmos are still trying to work out exactly how long the Expedition 58 crew will remain on station and exactly when they'll be joined by another crew. Now, speaking of the space station, SpaceX has successfully launched its CRS-16 Dragon cargo ship carrying 2,540 kilograms of fresh supplies and equipment for the orbiting outpost. The 16th crew commercial resupply mission blasted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida after a 24-hour delay due to some minor technical issues. The mission was marred by the failure of the Falcon 9 core stage to successfully land on its drone recovery barge. Instead, going off course and undertaking a watery splashdown due to a faulty grid fin hydraulic pump. The good news is the booster was successfully recovered in the North Atlantic Ocean and will be refurbished for use on a future flight. By the way, the Dragon capsule used for CRS-16, well that's the same capsule used last year for the CRS-10 mission. CRS-16 is carrying equipment, supplies and materials for over 250 scientific experiments. Investigations on this flight include a test of robotic technology for storing and refueling spacecraft in orbit. Also aboard is a small satellite deployment system called Slingshot. It'll be fitted onto the Cygnus cargo ship prior to its departure from the space station. Once equipped with Slingshot, the Cygnus will be flown to an altitude of 500 kilometres, that's 100 kilometres higher than the space station's standard orbit, from where it will deploy up to 18 CubeSats. Another study transported to the space station aboard Dragon will try to better understand why muscles deteriorate in microgravity. Then there's the project called the Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation, or JEDI for short. It'll be mounted on the Japanese Kibo module and will use radar ranging observations to develop three-dimensional maps of the world's forests, snowpacks and glaciers, a case of may the forest be with you. Other studies will examine accelerated ageing in microgravity and growing perfectly ordered protein crystals for research into the antioxidant manganese superoxide dismutase, which may protect organisms from some types of cancer, radiation and harmful chemicals. Dragon's also carrying several CubeSats for future in-orbit launches. 
And there are a number of experiments on board designed by American high school students. One of the advantages in having an active space program. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has confirmed that the Greenland ice sheet has been melting much faster in the past decade than at any other time over the last 350 years. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are based on examination of melt layers in ice core samples from western Greenland dating back to 1650. Scientists found the ice sheet began melting more quickly soon after the onset of industrial-era Arctic warming in the mid-1800s. But the ice sheet saw its biggest surface melt in 2012, and ice core samples from 2004 to 2013 have shown more sustained and intense melting than during any other 10-year period. A new study has found a link between neonatal vitamin D deficiency and schizophrenia. The findings published in the journal Scientific Reports shows that newborns with vitamin D deficiency had a 44% increased risk of being diagnosed with schizophrenia as adults compared to those with normal vitamin D levels. The results could help prevent some cases of the disease by treating vitamin D deficiency during the earliest stages of life. A new study has confirmed that children in Western countries are entering puberty far earlier than previous generations. The findings, reported in the International Journal of Pediatric and Perinatal Epidemiology, shows that daughters are having their first menstrual period three months earlier than when their mothers did. The study found that boys are also reaching several benchmarks for puberty around six months to a year earlier than what guys did 15 years ago. The study used information about puberty from some 14,759 children from the Danish National Birth Cohort, Researchers asked them about their development from the age of 11 and a half. Girls were asked about breast development, pubic hair, their first menstruation, acne and armpit hair, while boys were asked about whether their voices had broken, their first ejaculation, as well as pubic hair, acne and armpit hair. Based on this information, the researchers were able to calculate the age at which pubescent milestones were achieved. The study is important because early puberty could be connected to an increased risk for a number of diseases as adults, such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and certain types of cancers. A new study has found that drugs needed to treat hepatitis C are costing the Australian taxpayer more than a billion dollars a year, well and truly topping the list of drugs ranked by cost to government. The study found that cholesterol-lowering drugs and blood pressure drugs make up eight of the top ten most commonly used prescription drugs in Australia. But when it comes to cost to taxpayers, none of the most frequently used drugs are in the most expensive list. The lists of most commonly used and most expensive drugs are produced annually and are based on PBS and RPBS prescriptions. The scientific method involves observation, hypothesis, experimentation, analysis and conclusion. Science is all about critical thinking. It's a search for the truth. Don't just take someone's word for it. Test the claim. See if it's factual and stands up, or if it's just a great steaming pile of woo. That's what skepticism is all about, a search for the truth. And remember, scientific facts don't care if you like them or not. Often described as using weak health claims to pull on hip pockets, magnetic therapy promises to take away or relieve pain simply by placing little magnets on the bits of your body that hurt. Be it arthritis, carpal tunnel syndrome or headaches, it seems magnetic therapy is just as effective for every type of pain. And according to the science, that level of effectiveness is zero. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics joins us now to provide a skeptic's guide to magnetic therapy. I'm sure every family has a member who's into magnetic therapy at some stage or another. It's basically designed to ease pain, improve blood flow, various general sort of ill feelings, etc., by applying magnets. And the magnets can be applied as a band around your waist or as a ring. I've seen some of them as a necklace. All sorts of ways of wearing magnets close to your body. And supposedly there is a magnetic influence on various organs and components of your body. To make you feel better. The trouble is there's no proof of that at all. There's anecdotal evidence, but of course, you know, anecdotal evidence is not worth a lot. And there's certainly no scientific evidence to find any reason why this might happen. It's been around for a while. There's a lot of products. Choice gave a, a particular magnetic underlay that goes under your sheets on, on top of your mattress. They gave a shonky award to them and uh, that was well deserved. They're pretty harmless. I, d- yeah. I don't think they're going to do you a lot of harm. and They, they just won't do you a lot of good wallet. either. Apparently, it's a billion dollar industry. Barnum said it best, didn't he? There's a sucker born every minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, except I hate it. Anyway, 
actually, he didn't say that. Never mind. Oh, really? Tell someone me. That, said, that, that, someone that said he said it. There was a journalist. A journalist wrote it that Barnum had said it, but actually the real suggestion was it was the sort of thing that Barnum might say. But Barnum, of course, was a sceptic, and he actually had prizes for a challenge, like we do, for anyone who could come forward and prove a particular paranormal skill. So did Houdini at about the same time. He knew a fake when he saw one. He was quite serious about exposing fakes. Was he the yeah, one with the who Fiji Mermaid? Forward. Was that him? The female Fiji mermaid was the classic one, was basically a monkey tacked onto a bit of a fish. Didn't look much like an attractive mermaid, certainly not Disney standard. He did a lot of that sort of stuff, and it was, yeah, it was fun stuff by and large, and people came to see it. How many people believe it to be true, I don't know, but he was a showman through and through. But he never actually said that statement, which is interesting, because it's always applied to him. And that report by Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 